You're listening to the Ikra Book Festival 2020, brought to you by The Ark, Radio Ramadan 365, Al Khair, Human Relief Foundation, and Allison Street Cleaners. Allison Street Cleaners, is your laundry piling up? Are you too tired or busy to get it done? Come to Allison Street Cleaners, a fast and friendly laundrette. Services include dry cleaning, ironing, shirt service, and you can now also hire the rug doctor, making sure all your cleaning needs are fulfilled. Presenting you with an exclusive Ramadan special to Radio Ramadan listeners. £2 off every £10 spent until the 15th of June. Don't miss out. Visit us at 110 Allison Street, Glasgow, g 428 N or call 0141-423-3958 Alison Street Cleaners Clean water isn't a luxury It's the moral right of everyone Yet 785 million people live without it And the consequences are dramatic With diseases from dirty water Killing more people each year Than all forms of violence Including war It's why Human Relief Foundation bring clean water into the heart of communities. But they need your support to do more. Visit hrf.org.uk We believe that every child deserves a good education. This is the best way to ensure that they can achieve their full potential and escape a life of poverty for themselves and their families. All that these children want is a chance to learn and fulfill their dreams. With your donations, Al Khair Foundation helps thousands of children gain a quality education. Please support us so that we can continue to help some of the poorest children across the world. To learn more, please visit our Glasgow branch at 441A Victoria Road, Glasgow, G428RW or call on 0141-423-5747 or visit our website at alkhair.org. Hello and welcome back to the Ikra Book Festival, um, streaming on Zoom, Facebook and Ramadan 365. Um, we're sponsored by Al Khair Foundation today and I have Sajad Ayub and Etsko Skatema here. Um, Sajad is a seasoned business development con- uh, leader um, consultant for, with over 20 years experience in the EMEA region. And you've got a deep interest in Eastern and Western philosophy and developing various models to deliver that to Western audiences. That's right. Sounds really interesting. And we've got Etsko Skatema here, and he is the author of Millennium Discourses and the in- Intent Exploring the Core of Human Being. And um, I'll hand over to you, Sajad and Etsko, and um, I'll enjoy watching this session. Great. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, And firstly, you're you're doing a fabulous job um, and and, and the the festival is really, really coming along lovely. Um, So let me first introduce Etsko. Etsko, um, we first met, I think, about 10 years ago um, in Dubai when I was hosting a a, a festival and uh, I was fascinated by Etsko's work. And Etsko is the founder of the Skatema Group. They're a consultancy based on enhancing human excellence based on the care and growth model. Uh, He's born into a mining family in South Africa and grew up in Johannesburg and uh, did his honors degree in social anthropology at the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, He got a job as a graduate uh, researcher for the Chamber of Mines for South Africa's research organization and he was employed by the Human Resources Laboratory at the organization, where he initially focused on the conflict of the mines. Um, and at the end of the uh, overthrow of apartheid, the mines were swept, swept up with the upheaval of what followed. And he developed a framework of understanding to build trust in this volatile environment. Using the basis of his research, he headed up the Human Resources Laboratory which was an industrial project uh, to implement his insights. Um, And this is where the care and growth model originated. Uh, And his success, he had such success there that he left uh, the role of the Chamber of Mines with a group of his colleagues to establish this consultancy and use this particular model. And it's been widely disseminated 
Over the past 30 years, the, the Skatema group, under the leadership of Etsco, uh, and al alongside several of his associates, associates, has worked in over 26 countries in a large range of sectors, creating the powerful working relationships with a care, care and growth model. Um, some of the clients that he's dealt with are Cisco, Siemens, Shell, Ford, Mercedes, PepsiCo, Barclays, Unilever. I mean, the list just goes on of the organizations. Um, so Esko, welcome. Thank you for, for, for joining us today. I know that you're in Sweden. I can, you, <laughs> I can tell by the gray weather in the background. That, <laughs> Thank you very much. And you're an author of, of six books on, on, on leadership, uh, exploring the core and being human. Mm -hmm. And you've written a, a number of different books in this genre and also in, on the spiritual side as well. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to come into this whole area and, and just lead from there? Would you would you mind reading uh, from your book? Do you have a book? Well, not at all. So I, I thought. I mean, I'm ravaging. I asked my wife which I should, what I should kind of read from, and and, and um, you know, one only has five minutes. I, I know. So I, I thought I'd um, I'd read from a, a, a book on that, that explores the issue of growth through the lens of intent of how people grow through the lens of intent. And um, um, I just thought maybe a couple of pages from that, because that gives some understanding of the scope of some of the work that, that, that we do in our, in our, in our group. Um, <clears throat> so it's from intent, exploring the core of being human. Um, uh, and so it's from the introductory chapter. So the introductory chapter says basically the two intentions. It's about the two intentions. It's axiomatically true that at birth, the sum total of an infant's potential lies before it. It has had nothing yet. It hasn't achieved anything yet. And from this point of view, an infant is pure expectation with nothing yet realized. It is still going to get it all. It really doesn't matter if it all is another eight year, 80 years of metabolic misery or 80 years of ease. Whatever that potential is, we can say that it is owed by the other, which means that an infant is yet to get it all from the other. On day one, the infant is yet to get in the fullest, most absolute and unconditional sense. It is equally true that the moment of death, one loses everything unconditionally. At this point, we have, at this point, we have received all that we would have, we, we were destined to have received. There's nothing left to get. In fact, it is all there to lose or to give. When we die, we give it all unconditionally. Our liars are therefore pinned between these two points of unconditional, these two unconditional moments. We arrive getting it all and we leave giving it all. And the process of maturation which transmutes our lives involve, uh, involves a movement from one extreme of unconditional taking to the other extreme of unconditional giving. Uh, a counter to this argument would suggest that at the point of death, the subject doesn't give it all, but rather it all gets taken away. Um, on one level, of course, this is true. Um, this point would presuppose that the will of the dying person is not synchronized with the cataclysmic event that is unfolding. After all, what is the difference between the experience of being taken to the experience of giving something? The difference lies in the intention of the person who's going through the experience. If in a transactional sense, we remove the question of intent, there would be no difference between money being stolen from me or me making a gift of money. Um, what has happened in both instances for, is that the money went from my hand to another person's hand. In the case of the theft, I experienced the money as being taken from me because I had, didn't intend to give it. In the case of the gift, I intended to give the money, um, uh, which is why the, uh, I experienced that I gave. So the difference between the money being taken and the money being given lies in my intent. If the loss of the money was unavoidable, the person who gave the money has had an affirming and successful experience. Um, the person who had it taken, however, has suffered a negotiation. Death, death must therefore have two potentials. One is the unbridled horror that must ensue when the acquiring self sees all its aspirations nullified in an instance. Under these conditions, death is the great rape, the most extreme experience of being taken from. 
it is an absolute and annihilating negation. On the other hand, if the subject is able to hand it all over unconditionally, death becomes the most elevated and ecstatic statement of giving possible, precisely because it is unconditional. Insofar as our lives inevitably and inexorably aim us in the direction of this uncompromising gateway, it suggests that both appropriacy and inner health must be associated with cultivating the capacity to willingly and deliberately give unconditionally. That, that's, um, so, so, um, uh, so John, uh, that kind of serves as a, almost a cameo of uh, my life's fascination, which has been really this issue of intent and how the intent to serve accounts for success, um, both in terms of how you deport yourself as a person among people, in other words, as a business person or as a, as a leader in an organization, but also in terms of your own um, uh, growth as, as, a, as a human being, your, your spiritual maturation. It's, the, it's actually the same problem. So the, this, this thing that we like to bifurcate, you know, akhira fi dunya, the sort of the, the matters of this world and matters of the hereafter, matters of matter and matters of spirit. These things aren't as mutually exclusive as we sometimes like to think they are. They, it's actually the same problem. And, and I, um, so to come back to the question you asked initially, you know, just tell us a little bit about where this stuff comes from. My life has been, um, there have been two, uh, two elements that have sort of formed a symbiotic tension, which have been able to grow. The, the first has been my professional development um, and the, the development of, that started off with my research at the Chamber of Mines in the 80s. But then also, secondly, my own um, uh, inner quest um, uh, as, as an aspirant uh, in the Darqawa um, uh, uh, path of Sufism, Tasu. Uh, those two things together have kind of created the, 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 uh, I kind of the tension that's enabled mm. my own development as a person. I mean, the fascinating thing there is how do you take you know, you've got the spiritual side on one side and then you've got the leadership on the other. And mm. how do you holistically bring them together and, and then interweave them and interlock them together? Right. Um, and, and based on how did, you, how, did you, how did you formulate your thoughts? At what age did you realize, you know what, these two things are symbiotic. Right. You know, they, they, they come together, they form something. And how did that happen? Because I know that there's, People in the in the audience that are asking this question, how does you know somebody born in South Africa, Caucasian looking, <laughs> comes to this philosophy, this mind, and then bring bridges these two spiritual and leadership together, and and then articulates it in 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 a, in a book, and then goes out to all these corporate companies around the world and organizations. I know that there's a there's there's many questions that will come out of this, but mm. for you know we've got half an hour to forty five minutes oh. here. How how would you kind of sum that up and, and so, formulate your thoughts then? Um, Sajad, I've um, <clears throat> so let me give a bit of a background to the to the research. I mean, I was this organisation that employed me in the, in the eighties in South Africa it was called the Chamber of Mines Research Organization. They were quite a prestigious research outfit at the time, and they're quite large. They employed about 600 researchers, but mainly in technical laboratories. And there was a, a, a small lab called the Human, Res believe it or not, they actually called this lab this, the Human Resources <laughs> Laboratory. You can imagine what we did to people there in 1982, you know, with electrodes, and no, no, no electrodes. Anyhow, um, so, so yeah. Um, the, 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 the aim, I mean, every one of these labs had like a, um, what do you call a charter? Mm. And what was meant by a charter was a, a, kind of like a single line of text that described the scope of the work of the lab. And the charter of the Human Resources Laboratory, charmingly at the time, was to investigate the human problem on mines. Um, and the human beings on mines were problematic. I mean, as you know, the country was going through a civil war. And yeah. the thin end of the wedge of the resistance to the apartheid state, economic resistance, was actually happening on mines. And it was a very volatile, very bloody 
uh, a very conflict-ridden time. And in fact, the, 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 the project that I was assigned to initially looked at the issue of conflict, you know. Um, and, um, but what became apparent to me um, from about two or three years in was, you know, so the people like to speak about the, the problem of, of, uh, of bad management or of dealing with people as a behavioral issue. They even speak of it as a behavioral science. I heard people refer to management as a discipline, as a behavioral science. Yeah. And it struck me that this word behavior is not helpful. Hmm. Because I came across a number of people who, so, so uh, uh, who just, uh, the, 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 this, you couldn't account behaviorally for the, their success as leaders. Um, or you can't, you couldn't account for the success of leaders on the basis of their behavior. So probably the most extreme was a man by the name of, um, uh, his name was Cory Stuchlung. He was a, a mine overseer on a va mine called Valerie's West. He was a, a very large man. I mean, physically tall, like a head taller than me. Mm. And he, he um, a, a multiple black belt in karate, a scary piece of work. I mean, the guy had hands like spades, you know. He had a very large section of about a thousand men that reported to him. And he had this horrifying reputation for assaulting people underground. You know, the... <laughs> This man used to hit people at work. Now, I mean, now just imagine the historical context here. This is South Africa in the 80s. You know, I mean, the country's going through a civil war. The National Union of Mine Workers is busy crucifying every second management team in the industry. So he had um, the news of this Neanderthal at, uh, at Val Reese, who was still slapping people around underground, got to the head office of the company, which was Anglo Gold. They were scandalized at head office. They said, you can't do this anymore. You can't hit people. So they sent an instruction down to the mine to get rid of this guy. You know, I mean, you know, we don't care what you do to the guy. Plant dope in his locker or something, but fire him. The union's going to pillory us, you know. Anyhow, management on the mine was shocked because they didn't want to get rid of this guy because he was so good. So there was a big debate. What are we going to do with him? And then finally they decided, well, you know, we can't afford to fire the guy. He's just too important. He knows too much about our reef. So... What they decided to do is to, act to is, uh, as a compromise solution, take the guy out of a mining section mm. and, and basically give him a planning job, which is like a specialist job. Um, basically, so we wouldn't be dealing with people anymore. They wouldn't be so, uh, able to assault them. So, so they did that. They took the guy out of his section. They gave him a planning job. And his entire team, Sajjad, of a thousand men went on strike. Wow. They wanted their mine overseer back. Now, I mean, everybody who was a spectator to that piece of drama, were just, we were just gobsmacked, could not understand what had happened here. Until, so in fact, the, that crew stayed out on strike until management relented and they gave the guy's job back. The answer to the problem became apparent sometime later when there was a very serious fall of ground in Cory Stichling's section. Mm. And guess who was the last guy out the section? It was this Cory Stuchler. And now you know why his men trusted him, you see. Right. You know? Because they knew he was sincerely there for them. So at the time, I realized, but you know, this we're dealing with a model that tries to come to grips with kind of how people engage and how people disengage, how people commit to leaders or become alienated from leaders which is trying to create a behavioral model that doesn't work because people are looking at something deeper than, than the behavior. They're looking for the person's intent. And it stands to reason. I mean, you must have met people in your life who are very suave, very polished, you know, very genteel, and you couldn't trust the bugger as fast as you could throw him. And you could have met somebody else in your life who was really as rough as a bear's backside, and you would follow the guy to the gates of Alan back. Why? Because there's something more going on than just somebody's behavior. It's actually their intent. And this intent cuts fundamentally very simply. Are you there for yourself or are you there to make a contribution? Are you there to get or there to give? You know, this is the core problem that underlies the issue of leading people. Did you ever speak to this guy? Did you actually understand? From oh, yeah. him? Yes. I mean, so... so um, I'd actually met him and I'd, I'd done some work in his section and I, you know, I'd, I did actually speak to the guy. Yeah. 
I mean, he was just a very rough miner. He grew, it's a rough industry. And, you know, his idea was, you know, how, the best way to keep people alive in such a dangerous environment is just frighten them. Right. That was his intent. You know, uh, I'm not going to talk to you twice about sitting under a hanging that's going to kill you. Yeah. Uh, talk to you once. Second time, you will not sit under that hanging. I'll make, you know, I'll make sure. So I'm not suggesting, look, I mean, this is, one can't take the one historical example and turn that into an, an, a, a rule. I mean, you cannot do that. I'm not suggesting that that's at all behaviorally legitimate. All that I'm saying is that there's a deeper thing at issue than somebody's behavior it is the person's intent. And people actually have too much to work that intent out. Because they see you consistently act in situations where what's in your interest and what's the right thing to do. And how you act in those situations gives the game away. No matter how genteel your behavior is. So, so um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, so, so I, you know, the problem from a leadership point of view. So, so the, maybe I could just say, so there's this, there's this personal kind of issue that's associated with this. That it says that, listen, actually, this issue of intent isn't just concerned with how others see you and how you engage the world. It's actually the rule whereby you either die or, f or, 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 or where you die successfully or unsuccessfully. I mean, one day you're going to face a final exam. The last exam of Sajjad's life, the final exam. It's a hole. It's six foot deep. It's a very scary exam. But what's amazing about this exam, Sajjad's up, they only ask you one question in this exam. And that question is, are you able to lose absolutely everything unconditionally? Like, you see that beautiful house you're sitting in? The beautiful stuff behind you? All that? All that? Gone. Cheap. That's, that's not real, by the way. It's just... Uh, <laughs> it's not real. Well, so, so that's definitely going to happen to you. You are definitely... And, you, you know, so you're going to be asked, are you able to lose absolutely everything unconditionally right now? And either you, you either pass or fail that exam. Yes. You know? So... The final test of your life is a test of your ability to hand over, give, or contribute unconditionally. Right. This is the essence of being human. That, that, that skill is developed in, in how you deal with others, in your comportment with life, if, in, in your engagement with people at work, your, your subordinates at work. I mean, the miserable thing is that we present leaders in organizations with a set of categories that makes it virtually impossible for them to crack this code. Yeah, um, I mean, we teach leaders an understanding of the role which makes it impossible for them to crack this code. So they almost have to do violence to their own deep human nature to become managers. Because if you ask, I mean, I, I, I do submissions to leadership training at a number of business schools, and I have done this in a number of places throughout the world, you know, over decades. And I always find it intriguing to ask a group of students at a business school, so what does the word leadership mean? I mean, you're all yet to learn leadership. Yeah. Okay. What does the word mean? And you'll say to people, ah, oh, it's erudite definitions, you know. Um, but, you know, if you take all of that content, you can reduce it to two core themes. The first theme has to do with people. I mean, obviously, you know, you lead people. You know, um, that's what differentiates leading from managing. You can manage a, a warehouse of chairs. If you try to lead that warehouse of chairs, they'll lock you up in a lunatic site. You know, so we lead with the word. First of all, it's about people. And secondly, it's about an outcome, about a business a result, a direction, or achieving some sort of an outcome. So if you ask the average leader today, what does the word leadership mean? He's going to say to you, leadership is about achieving a result or an outcome through people not realizing that he's therefore propagating the great take because that statement is a taking intent. And, and we've got a very easy kind of um, thought experiment to kind of uh, make the point. Um, uh, so, so if we, so we, we, you know, clearly, I mean, you want to create the conditions where people are going to work for you because they want to, not just because they have to, if, they, if you're in a leadership role. So let's say you've got two people. Let's be very inventive, two very English people. We're going to call the one Fred and the other one Joe. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got two subordinates, uh, Sir John. If Fred and Joe are listening, this is not about them. Yeah, we're not, it's not aimed at them, Fred. 
uh, don't worry, Fred. Anyhow, so you say to Fred in your uh, inevitable way, you say to him, Fred, um, in 1999, I did the job that you have to do now. And what I did worked. Don't argue with me, Fred. Shut up and go do what I did. I don't think Fred's going to work for you because he wants to. He's going to work for you because he has to. Um, uh, you say to Joe, Joe, in 1999, I did what you have to do now and what I did worked. It may be helpful to you, Dad. Check it, take a look at it. Um, you know, he'll work for you because he wants to. Now, you could ask, so what's the difference between the two? Fred's going to, it's the same experience that you had in 1999. Same, you know, but, but what's the difference in terms of the person's kind of experience of what you're saying? Well, Fred is going to experience that you basically being very autocratic and domineering and, you know, and Joe's going to experience that you, your behavior is much more participative and democratic. It's all true. But what isn't immediately apparent is that there's something going on under the surface which we don't normally account for. And that becomes apparent when you separate two variables in your mind, means and ends, you know. And you put into those two categories either the person who's doing the job and the job that's being done. So if you say to Fred, Fred, in 1990, uh, I did what you have to do, what I did worked. Uh, don't argue with me, do what I did. Your end is to get the same job done as what you did in 1999. And Fred becomes your means to get that job done. You're using the person as the means to achieve an outcome. You're achieving a result through people, through the person. In the Joe case, something really intriguing is happening. Intriguing is happening. If you, if you say to him, it might be helpful to take a look at it. Clearly, you could have a completely different outcome from what you had in 1999. It could be a complete disaster. So, in, in fact, your intent, in other words, is not about achieving the result, the same outcome. It could be a, a different outcome. Your intent is to teach Joe something. And what gives you the opportunity to teach him something is the job that he's doing. In other words, you're not using him as the, as the means to get a job done, using the job as a means to teach him something. Yeah. You're not achieving a result through the person. You're achieving the person through the result. Leadership is not about achieving results through people. It's about achieving people through results. See, that's a, that's a different concept because over here, yeah. you know, it's all about what the leaders want is you do your job and it's, exactly. it's, it's downward management. Yeah. And, and so, you, you can, so, so we don't realize that the way to, that your success as a leader actually is a grappling with the same problem. Are you willing to forego outcomes? Are you willing to construct your day-in-day -day engagement with others and with your life on the basis of what you should be contributing rather than what you want to get? This is a universal problem. It sits at the basis of how you interact with others in a team sense. It sits at the basis of your business model. I mean, if you're running a business, you have to understand supply exists to serve demand, not the other way around. Right. If you're going into the market in order to make a profit, you, they should shoot you at the, 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 the gates of the marketplace. You, you don't have license to trade. Because a business isn't there to make money. A business is there to serve customers and clients. That's what businesses are there for. Then you have a right to be in the market. Supply is there to serve demand, not the other way around. Right. So, so from every point of view, whether you're running a business, whether you're dealing with a colleague at work, whether you're dealing with subordinates, whether you're dealing with this deeply existential problem of being a human being in a human skin, you're actually grappling with the same issue. And that is your intent. Your intent is the cornerstone problem. And unless you're making your intent like the, the Kaaba, the, the core issue that you circumambulate around, your, the whole life is concerned with that you'll be wasting this opportunity of having been a human being. And you're playing Russian roulette with the possibility of dying eloquently. Because you can only describe an eloquent death as a death that's rooted in the intent to give unconditionally. Right. Now, there's a, there's a number of questions that have been asked while you've been, while you've been sharing. So let me just pose some of these questions. Uh, there was a question here saying, um, your consultancy work in Pakistan, you know, where does you, you see that in the leadership? I know that you've got a, uh, an office in Pakistan. I know that you've got a, a business in Sweden as well. Mm -hmm. And there's another question here. Businessmen in, in the UK seem to be bored and have lost their spark. And even though they may be wealthy, can you see that this philosophy revitalizes some of them losing their soul? You have a two so questions. which one do you want me to answer? 
the first one, please. So just a little bit about Pakistan. I know we're going to kind of... So we have a, we have a, we, there is a, the, we have a, we've, we've had a number of approaches to reproducing the business in other parts of the world. The approach we took in Pakistan was a franchise model that didn't, that, that as a, sort of could be more optimal. But so there's a Pakistani franchise that, that, that runs with um, our IP, our branding, fully equipped to do absolutely everything that we do. I no longer have a role in that business, but we're still colleagues. Yeah. So, I mean, I used to be a, a part owner of that business until about, I don't know, about a, a decade ago now. Yeah. Um, uh, but they, they've been running on their own since then. Um, <clears throat> the, the second question you asked was? Uh, the second question is that a, a businessman in businessmen here seem to be bored and they've lost their spark. Even though they've made accumulated a lot of wealth, i.e. money, mm. possessions, there, could this philosophy revitalize something that they've lost, you know, they've lost from their soul? Because they, they're, they're left empty, you see. They have all these yeah, possessions, okay. they have the fancy cars, they have the huge big houses, they have possessions. There's nothing there. You know, you're talking about the akhira, the, yeah. the, the six foot under. What can wake so up? So what, what satisfies the heart? I mean, there's a, that's a very layered question, by the way. I mean, so, I mean, you know, I mean. That was but, from Dr. Nadim. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So what satisfies the heart? So we get this view that, well, if, I'm, if I've got the Merck and I've got the big bank account, I've got all the assets, then I'll be full. I'll have a satisfied heart. So you've got somebody who's now got the big bank account and they've got all the, they've got the Merck and they've got the big house and they're empty. Yeah. So, 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 well, maybe um, they've been sold a lie. And I think it's true. Well, well, let's not blame anybody. They've sold themselves a lie. Yeah. Because they don't understand that this hole, this emptiness in the chest, can't be filled with things. Because it's actually fathomless. Mm -hmm. You can get all the money in the world. You can get so you, a, an infinite number of zeros of nothings. <laughs> to the end of the bank, you know, all the way out the middle, right over the horizon. So number number zeros, you know, it, you just get all it, you, it'll still be empty because this hole, this emptiness, this discontentment in the heart, this doesn't get filled by what you get from the world. It gets, doesn't get filled by what comes from the world to you. It gets filled by what leaves you for the world. Mm -hmm. If you don't construct your day-to-day -day life, your business life on the basis of a passion to be of service, to your, your, your Lord, your fellow man, and to the world out there, it will leave you empty and destitute. It must do. It cannot do otherwise. Oh. The tragedy is that we, we then end up in our mid-40s mid to mid-60s, depending on the person, and we, we, we look around at all the stuff, and then we blame the stuff because we're, we're unhappy. Or we blame the family, you know. We've so you you with your wealth, you got this trophy car, you got the trophy wife, the trophy career. You sent the children to the trophy public schools. You know, half of them are smoking dope in the backyard. You say, what on earth has all this been about? They're miserable, and then you think I can get rid of them and replace them with a new sort of uh, set of actors. You know, get the blonde twenty-one-year-old knee on my uh, on my knee, and are you crazy? This does, you know, this is not how to do this, deal with this problem. You know, you, the, the, because there isn't, the fault doesn't sit in the object. It doesn't sit in the world. The fault sits with you. How you've constructed your intent sits on the inside. Learn how to work on the inside. That's the key issue. We don't have a technology to work on the inside, either in terms of how we deal with our work life, how we deal with our spiritual life, how we, 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 we've turned it into, uh, uh, you know, if it is, it becomes obscurantist, mumbo jumbo. There's no real understanding of what it means to actually do inner work and to make that inner work pragmatically impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Do ladies and gentlemen have the same problems? Well, we do, fundamentally. Because the fundamental problem we're dealing with is the proximity of death. So, so we, you know, and I don't think they evade, the, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think they evade the issue, do they? Yeah. Huh. He's right here.
you know, for you to whoever you are. So we, we're all facing the same problem. Yeah. Now, you see, I don't think it's a, it's a, so, so, so in the deepest sense, we all have strategies to try and avoid, avoid the horror of having to deal with that problem. Right. You know, the, the common one today is accumulation. Um, and accumulation is saying, I'm going to get enough stuff to put a bulwark between myself and the Grim Reaper. This, my stuff will protect me. This is the most bizarre idea. I mean, my stuff will protect me. There's not a single asset that you have will have that will rally to your defense and intercede on your behalf when Malikil walks through the door, you know? Now, now, women very often think that's in the relationship. Because particularly if the woman has been in, you know, not had a career, she's been in a house, she's in the household, family. Mm. You know, so so it's, it's, a, it's a more subtle way of dealing with a problem. It's a more humane way of dealing with a problem because it is about relationship, not about things. But do you honestly think that anybody that you know in your acquaintance is going to intercede on your behalf when death walks through the door? You know, they're not, none of them are going to say, I'll take it for you. Hey, it's just fine. No, no, they'll, they'll scarf it just like your goods are going to scarf it. So it's the same problem. It's just framed differently. This idea that we can put stuff between ourselves and the inevitable issue of having to lose it all unconditionally. So what can we do to, 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 to recenter ourselves? Because at the moment, you know, we're living in this society. We're consumed by the television, the internet, the social media, you know, webinars, everything else, we, we lose track. And how do we center? How do we bring, how do we center ourselves? And, and from, from your perspective. And so, so I think, I mean, we're, I, we're running out of time as well. We've got four minutes. Oh, I've been told. Okay, right, right. Big pardon. So, uh, so Jatsab, I think the how to is not that difficult because there's, 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 I mean, so this wonderful man who was speaking just before that when I came on, I was watching him, uh, Dr. Arya. Yes. Um, I mean, there's very helpful people like that. They can tell you about mindfulness. Um, as a Muslim, we know we have a masala. We have, you know, we have the technology. We have the technology to do inner work. You know, the issue is that we're not convinced about the significance of doing inner work. Right. It's not important enough. We don't, you know, so, so there's, a, there's like a, there's a piece of work that needs to be done before all of this which is to convince ourselves that inner work is really legitimate work. It's not skiving off. It's not being frivolous and it's not being shallow. It's actually the only work that means anything. If you, if you really want to be a good leader, become acquainted with your masala. Let's start there. As in your prayer mat. So that's yes. your focus. That's, that's the that's the inner spirituality. Find, learn how to unconditionally hand over on a routine basis. You know, div, make your make the core problem that you're needing to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, not the world that you're experiencing, but you, the experiencer. Keep a journal for heaven's sake. You know, I mean, so, so what people don't, uh, you know, our, our society is very good at cultivating. <laughs> A confusion of of um, of uh, of a confusion of size with significance. The bigger the thing, the more significant it is. So, so like capitalism, the system defines the individual. You know, the company defines the worker. The 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 city defines the city. No, actually, the only thing that ever exists is an individual. The individual defines everything. It's all about the individual. It's not about anything else, you know? I mean, the, the relationship between the individual and the system is like the relationship between, between uh, weather and climate. Um, if you're looking, you know, if you, if, um, so, so it's, uh, we're in August, October now. We've had, my wife and I went out for a wonderful meal, most extraordinary, it's actually, I mean, it is a bit gloomy looking now, but we've had a sunny day. You know, you could come, you could come in Ling Shopping now and you say, wow, you live in the most balmy climate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a balmy day. It's a, you know, don't confuse the weather for the climate. Right. You know, so in other words, the climate is an abstraction. The social system is an abstraction. So you can have a perfectly halal transaction, legitimate value adding transaction 
in a capitalist system, you could have in a social system. Don't make the system the problem. Right, exactly. It's the individual. It's one the has to look at It's up only ever about the individual. Right. There's right. no such thing as corporate cultures. There's no such thing as it only it's you are the you you are not on the periphery. The individual is at the center. The individual is the most most powerful, most uh, or, uh, transformative, extraordinary being. There is nothing other. There's no uh, ideal system, you know, the sort of Islam against this, against that. It's all nonsense. Thank you so much. We, uh, I think we're running out of time on, on our side here as well. Um, so for those that are interested in Etsco's work, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, please go to www.skatermagroup.com. He's written six books and in the area of leadership excellence. Um, there's so much more that we could discuss, maybe for another time, or <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if there's any other questions, um, there's a quick one here. Uh, there's taken on a concept, but explore a little bit more, yeah. So is there anything that you'd like to say, Sophie? <coughs> Thank, just thanks very much um, to you, Sajad, and also Etsco. It's been so interesting, um, really quite breathtaking, give me a lot to think about. Thank you. Um, we are really tight on time, so we're just about to go to an ad break, and then um, the next ho uh, co host will be taken over, and that's Dawood Duncan. Um, and because we're so tight on time, I will say thank you again. Thank and you. All the best. Goodbye. Thanks. You're all the best. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I'm looking to the lamp.